So there's a world of bots coming and most of the conversation right now is around the humanoid form. Because it is so flexible, humans are really quite good at doing a lot of different jobs. <laughs> God did a great job. Anyway, so we're, but what's happening now is there's situations where sometimes the humanoid form isn't maybe the best form. And Brian has put together a number of slides here. Brian, uh, interesting slides coming up about some specialized bots that can do very unique kinds of tasks. And I think that will be another big part of this bot revolution. Yes, uh, we're just like look at the NASA Ames uh, doing some very interesting things with uh, a slinky light bot. Yeah, and it is even I think we're going to talk about how bots in space, I think will be a big part of what the bot future is all about, where who knows where some of you, you or some of your children, our grandchildren might be living in the future. All right, let's get into it. Okay. So in discussing space and discussing special purpose systems. This is a work from a paper by NASA Ames, where you see this kind of like a, a specialized uh, U-shaped robot, snake-like robot thing. Huh. So it's designed to put together these um, these um, uh, ball and stick kind of um, components, which are more advanced, like, like the 3D printed design or that kind of thing. And then it's building up a structure. So it's mostly air. So you can see that even though it's got metal struts in it, it's mostly air, so that it's, for the volume, it weighs 1% of water. So if I have what would be, you know, a one meter by one meter by one meter thing, roughly the size of a washing machine, if I was up all, all water, that'd be weigh a ton. But right. with this this structure, it would weigh like, um, you know, 10 kilograms. I see. So it, so instead of a thousand kilograms, it weigh ten kilograms. Yeah. Um, so that so, but it's a very strong structure, very rigid. So they can take eighteen kilograms in a backpack, go out, and they have gone out, and then they can assemble a bridge, and they can walk over the bridge. They can make it into a boat, and then it'll float and and, and do whatever. Um, so, and then this is uh, ultra strong self programming mechanical materials. So then they can also have actuators on it. And you see the top on the right, you see the tiny little blue thing and then the, yeah. the red and the green. So that's in the video animation, those things like kind of like going like that, like it's like the bottom part of two legs. So it's, it's like a slinky and it's then taking the pieces up and assembling them and it can make it into like a skyscraper structure, right? Oh. So for space bases, you can then apply this thing. The, the reason that I discussed that, you know, Bolton Gripper is that if you design something for robotic manufacturing, like um, IKEA made their furniture for the customer to assemble, right. and they also made it flat packed, right? So they reinvented furniture. IKEA furniture isn't everywhere, but it's, it's like it's a, a major, you know, multi billion dollar business right. where they did right. that. Here, there is the potential for entirely new ways to build things that could be lighter, better, stronger, which um, people could say, okay, I don't want to go generalize, but if you can make a kind of super Ikea of manufacturing for a big enough use case, right? Right. Where it's like, okay, is it too specialized? Is it only going to be a small market for, you know, the equivalent of a billion dollars worth of, with of cups or something like that, right. or is it a major segment of transportation? Is it a major segment of, of real estate construction, right? So, so then there's some experimentation to be involved. Like, how fast can I act upon it and do the advantages of doing it an entirely new way? You know. Yeah, in, in fact, Brian, uh, just this morning is pretty funny because just this morning I read an article about this company. I think they're a European company. I want to say, um, not, I can't remember the country for sure, but they have invented or not just invented, they are actually in already using a brick-laying robot. Uh, right. Um, I, I heard about that. I think it's, um, um, was it, 
Yeah, it was, it was a European company, um, right. Norway, Sweden, Germany, something like that, 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 that did that. Right. So yeah. there's an example of, uh, of, it's not a humanoid robot, but it is a robot of uh, the type you're talking about here, where it's specifically mm -hmm. designed to lay brick, which is, yeah. a, which is a, 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 the kind of tedious, um, dangerous, hard on your body job that we're, that Elon has talked about the fact that he wants to replace with Optimus is those kind of, uh, uh, those kind of jobs. Yeah. Right. And then if we're there for the large labor component, right. Um, they broke up the task into three different pieces so that one uh, thing would be fetching the bricks and the other would be, you know, delivering and the other would be laying in. Um, and then they, um, so for those kind of things where it's like, I need a lot of it. I need to do a lot of brick walls. I also need to make a lot of solar, right? So right. solar and batteries where I need to deploy a lot of things over a large area are areas where um, if I could reduce the labor cost of a large solar field from, you know, two thirds mm -hmm. down to 10% or it was 20% down to, to, to five that would be a, a massive impact and it's also that not only the cheaper i could build it faster right right so that would be something where it's like, like the only thing holding back solar from going from like you know five uh, percent of global energy up to a hundred percent or to eighty percent you know some, some large number and also increasing the overall amount of energy is you know cost and speed to build out yeah connecting it up to, to the thing so if i the redesign those things where i can like you know, lay it down quickly and then assemble and lay them out. And then, then that is something that could move the needle. So I think that it's the, the area of speed is where can I make things overall faster in my um, AI building process? The AI needs a lot of energy. Right. I mean, I mean to make AI compute centers. So if I have a, a robotic system that let me build AI centers faster and cheaper and build the energy cheaper, then I'm bootstrapping myself into a further and further lead where it's right. like, I can't knock you out just by building, you know, some robots faster or supplying them to customers. But if my overall speed of improvement goes faster, right? where I'm, I'm like, my data centers pop up twice as fast as yours, right? then I start pulling away, right? So that's that's where the the knockout blows would happen. Where it's like, if I can start making energy, you know, like China was building energy faster than anyone for the last four decades, and it was a major uh, national advantage, right? Huh? Mm -hmm. if, if then now other countries can get into that game, you know, then that changes the whole geopolitical situation. Exactly. Um, so then where are there no limits, there are no limits in space. Like currently there's limits on the ground because, okay, you know, do I have the rights to do it? Can I install these things? You know, China's opened up whole areas of, of the Gobi Desert to do their solar installs. But areas where the robots can make things exponential, where, you know, I make one robot, it makes two, it, two makes four, eight, in 10 generations of a thousand, 20 generations have a million, Right. Thirty years and have a billion. No limits in space. A company that's that's um, involved in that, SpaceX, could like start making satellites faster. Could start deploying um, Tesla bots, mining on the moon, Mars, asteroids. That where it's like the fact that it's once it can solve the whole loop, mm -hmm. mining, building, assembling, mining, building, assembly, right. and it's right. a, it's a more simplified thing where it's like. I doesn't have to build everything, you know, like not everything out of, out of this component. It's just like, what are the components of the manufacturing process? And if I go back to this process where I reinvent manufacturing, mm -hmm. where it's just like, I need to make these sticks. I need to make these actuators. I can bring the component list down to 10 things. Mm -hmm. And then I have the bot to make it. So if I can simplify the bot from a thousand different components, down to 100, down to 50, then it may not change things on Earth because the complexity 50, 100, yeah, it's a little advantage, 5% more margin, whatever. But up in space, where I dump down 
a thousand simplified bots. They do mining. They just make some rod things and snap them together. Right. And suddenly I have a huge city on the moon and I'm mining it and I'm making uh, super giant telescopes. So having choosing the right use case where it's like, I got no limits, where, where the fact that the capabilities I have, where I can totally transform the surface of another planet, mm -hmm. right? You know, that's where, you know, you still want to change the earth and do that and, and make all these companies and do all the things. But there's like, there's another areas, way. another level to this, where once you close the loop on can it mine itself? Can it make this thing and do the entire vertical integration, soup to nuts, everything from raw materials? And right. SpaceX has talked about that in some of the calls. Yeah, we said, I want to go from raw materials to whatever. Right. Why do you want to do that, Elon? Why do you want to go from <laughs> raw materials to everything? It's like you want to recreate a civilization on another planet or something. Oh yeah, you do want to do that, <laughs> and that's how you're going to do it. Right. And and you have all these. So, so that's, um, and then making the satellites bigger and faster. So then the, the reduction of components, reduction of complexity, if I can get out materials I don't need, it's another material I don't have to mine. Right, right. And if I reduce the weight with the structure 1%, again, it makes it easier for me to, to build things. And I can then add in a, a, a membrane layer and then toss on regolith and dirt and stuff like that to, to complete the whole process. So simplification of civilization taken to an extreme means that we can exponentially recreate things with the army of, of, of robots. So that goes beyond, so the levels are do an entire factory, 10,000 people, up the production, up the, the level, right? Beyond the, the 200, 100 people, 210 people thing, where I, I can prove it works to actually impacting the efficiency of the bottom line and the production. And then um, ramping up the production, then going to completed use case systems where I simplify and change the process. And then uh, there was the Stanford example about how you can, uh, the three uh, students um, used uh, teleoperation, stuff like that. So there's a question about, is it all video or the teleoperation does it help? That's an open question as to how much that's needed. Um, but if you have um, teleoperation at scale, you could um, have outsourcing to low-income countries. So there's an intermediate phase, which is unclear where it applies. Um, there are teleoperation of sur surgery now, and they have been for over a decade, right. where a surgeon, a brain surgeon, would use da Vinci uh, robots to do high-precision brain surgery and that kind of thing. So there is a question about whether that use case is something that uh, matters. And then the training side of things where co-training, which is working with a human. So it's like, how much do we need the humans to help? So it's like, how much do we need the humans to redesign things? How much do we need to, on the training? Uh, still an open question. And so that's uh, basically the um, the slide. They have other things about economics, but those are more lengthy um, discussions. Okay, all right, well, great. Uh, so. Uh... Everybody, you know what you need to do. You need to hit the like and the subscribe button. You need to hit the notify button. And you also need to uh, follow Brian over at nextbigfuture.com where there's more information. We do some of the stuff on video that's also over there, but we do it in great more detail, of course, on the videos. But there's also other things that don't get on the videos that are over at nextbigfuture.com. And guess what? You see them sooner if you're interested in, in getting it as soon as the information becomes uh, available, as soon as it breaks in the news. Um, Brian, any other thoughts? Uh, yeah, so I think it's a, a, a lot of things to explore the, the, the complexities around this thing, but it's it's worthwhile because it can and will change the world in, in a big way far sooner than many people expect. <laughs> far sooner. That's right. All right. So uh, it, I hope you enjoyed and uh, we'll see you again next time.